and I, so I was in Somalia. Uh, we were actually in the province of the, of the pirates. Last year, $150 million in parachute was dropped on the pirates as a, as a, as a ransom. It is the only economy that Somalia has where civil war has been raging for 19 years. And one of the effects of the civil war was the scrapping of the Somali Navy and Coast Guard. So then the European and especially Spanish trawlers come in and scoop up all the fish from the coast. So what's left, what's left for the fishermen? They, uh, they turn into pirates. And while we were there, there was an attack on Mogadishu, the capital, by a force of 4,000 Islamic fighters, 2,000 of whom were foreigners from Yemen, from Iran, uh, from, from Saudi, and, and, and some of Western appearance. And they took half of, half of the capital. And the first thing they did was to set up training camps for Islamic fighters. You know, guess, guess where they're headed? Something wicked this way comes. But nobody, there's no, no, there are no journalists there. Uh, journalism seems full of celebrity stuff and footballers' wives and footballers' girlfriends, but there is no sustained coverage of the wars in Somalia and Yemen, which is now another focus of Islamic terrorism. Or Darfur, or the Congo, there's a, and there are great tides of ref refugees going on there. So I think one thing we have to understand is we do live in a dangerous world. I think we live in the most dangerous world since 1963. But we're not getting it. We're not getting it from our newspapers. There's such a thing in military analysis as a, as a black swan theory. This is talking about when Donald Rumsfeld was heavily criticized three, four years ago for talking about the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. He was reflecting conventional analysis going on inside the Pentagon. The 9-11 was a black swan event. Why a black swan? Because we've always assumed from all the evidence of our senses for, for centuries that all swans had white feathers. In the 19th century, black swans were discovered in Australia. So we have to rethink. So a black swan event is something that comes out of the blue, uh, is unpredictable, and upsets all our expectations. Here's my black swan poem. There is a time for peace, a time for war, a time for sleep, a time for being prepared. You know what I think this is a time for? It is a time for being really scared. Nuclear arsenals proliferate, pirates and paramilitaries abound, calamities of nature devastate once peaceful states become a killing ground. Black swan events are those that cannot hurt us because they never have, the world agrees, until they do, like fire on phosphorus. The 9-11 attacks were some of these. These are the analysts' unknown unknowns, the things we can't predict and never will. They are not traceable on mapped war zones, but strike us from the blind side of the hill. We hear the beating of the black swan's wings, which we thought couldn't happen. We were wrong. We are beset by strange outlying things, and one of these could be the black swan song. Back to journalism. Last year, I did the introduction to a, a collection of William Howard Russell's dispatches from the Crimea, 1854. And they're brilliant, first-hand reporting, rather flowery language. You don't get that now. You get embedded coverage, you get reporters on hotel rooftops and cowering in green zones. The, the readers of the Times in 1854 were better <coughs> informed about the war in, Korea, in, in Crimea than the readers of any newspaper or the viewers of any television network about the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, all the wars of our time. And we have to know the known unknowns, how much we, how much we, how much we don't know. Another quote from the same time. John Bright, the great reformer and Quaker from Rochdale. He said, there is a growing of feeling of bitterness and anger which has for a long period conducted the public affairs of this country. He said, the angel of a death is abroad in the land. You can almost hear the beating of his wings. And that was at the time of the Crimean War. And now, again, the angel of death is abroad in the land. And we have that gap between the political class and the rest of the people. As people come up to me and I, <coughs> I give speeches like this up and down the country and they I, I do it on cruise ships and people say well that's what we all think why aren't we hearing it from anybody else well I hope you will in the coming election campaign I mean honestly ladies and gentlemen if you want the creeps and the cranks to run your lives all you have to do is nothing and the creeps and the cranks will be happy to oblige 
there are plenty of them out there. I found being in Parliament the most, one of the most dismaying experiences of my life. Uh, because I had expected better, I suppose. I thought it would, I thought, I thought I would be with better people, but I wasn't. Um, so it's up to us. <coughs> now, the Duck Island Parliament is going to be history in a matter of weeks, unwarned by all but its inmates. And that's good. Uh, bad politics end. Wars end. Uh, recessions end. So we can make a new beginning. So besides a new House of Commons, what do we need? I think steadiness under fire is one quality and battlefield courage is another. But we need more than battlefield courage. We need intelligence in both its meanings. We need to understand better what's going on in the world around us. We need crow's heads lookouts of the highest quality. We need to be smarter, more nimble, more alert than we have been in these past years. We need to watch out for those black swan events. We need to watch out for the village with no chickens in it, because that can affect us too. And we need to communicate. It's no good pulling up the drawbridge and hoping that the dangers will go, will go away, because they won't. And I'm now going to close with my favorite bad joke of all time, uh, because it is about communication and our tendency to, to talk past each other and not to listen to each other. It is a transcript of an exchange of radio messages between the Canadians and the Americans in the North Atlantic in October 1994. I will not attempt the accents, but I'll give you the verbatim. First of all, you hear the Americans request you change your course one five degrees to the north to avoid a collision, to which the Canadians reply, I request you change your course one five degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Americans come back, I say again, change your course one five degrees to the north, and the Canadians reply, I say again, you change your course one five degrees to the south. Now the Americans are getting really upset. This is the captain of the USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest capital ship in the Atlantic fleet. We have with us three frigates, four destroyers, and numerous support ships. I say again, change your course one five degrees to the north, or this battle group will take action to defend itself. To which the Canadians replied, this is a lighthouse, your call. Thank you.